find out more details about why the earth was created and answers to questions about the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, all coming up in today's episode. Hi everyone, this is Ben Peterson and welcome to the Hope in Christ podcast. This is a weekly conversation that follows the Come Follow Me curriculum of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In these conversations, we dive deep into the scriptures and words of modern prophets to build our hope and faith in Jesus Christ and help him prepare the earth for his second coming. I'm so glad that you're listening today and really hope that you enjoy our episode. Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to our second episode from the Old Testament. Today, we'll be discussing the creation story from Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And as we discussed in our last episode, the Old Testament story doesn't begin in the book of Genesis. So if you missed our last episode, go back and listen to it where you'll discover a lost chapter that was originally part of Genesis that has been removed from the Bible and restored through Latter-day Prophets, where we get an introduction to the story of Genesis and learn some fundamental truths about God's plan and what the Old Testament is all about. The Old Testament text takes us from the creation of the world, or even before the foundations of the world, up to about 400 BC. And you might recall that Moses lived about 1400 BC. And so what we read in the book of Genesis is a flashback or retrospection of what has happened up until the time of Moses. These are things that he's been shown in vision or things he's pulling from other ancient records that he has access to. And the word Genesis means beginning. And the book of Genesis is a book of many beginnings. It's the beginning of the earth, the beginning of life on the earth, the beginning of man, the beginning of sin, the beginning of mortality, the beginning of death, the beginning of the gospel being taught on the earth, beginning of tribes and families and nations, the beginning of a covenant people of the house of Israel in their second estate here on earth. Now, 11 chapters of this book are dedicated to the time between the creation and Abraham. And then 39 chapters are focused on the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his sons. The Lord seems to give them some context about the covenant and then emphasizes that covenant that he made to Israel and how important it is for Israel to understand their true identity as his covenant people. Those teachings and events in the book of Genesis will prepare the Israelites, the early house of Israel, for the exodus and for their rebirth into a new nation as the Lord leads them out of captivity and into their own promised land, which you will see throughout your study this year is a symbol of our own promised land. Now, it's important to remember as we studied the creation story, the context for this story that was given to us in Moses chapter 1, where Moses sees the vision of all of God's creations on this earth and then asks the question, why? Why are these things so? Why does all of this exist? What is the purpose of all of it? And God gives him as an answer this story of the creation. So if you're looking to understand how God created the earth, the Bible is not the place to go. In fact, I don't know a source on earth that would be a good place to go because God's not revealed to us the details about how the earth was created. But the Bible gives us a very good description of why it was created. So that's one of the questions we want to have on our mind as we study these chapters. What is the purpose of the earth? Latter-day Saints have today four major accounts of the creation. One of them is found in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. One is found in Joseph Smith's inspired translation of Genesis 1 and 2, which is today found in Moses chapters 2 and 3. And then also Abraham's record in the book of Abraham chapters 4 and 5. And the fourth one is taught in the temples of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So as we discuss the creation story and even into the Garden of Eden and the fall I'll take details from all four of those accounts, but I'll draw primarily upon the text of Moses chapter 2 and 3 in today's episode. There are some slightly different nuances in each of those accounts, but when studied within their own contexts, they don't conflict with each other. For example, if you take the temple account, that is meant specifically to help us understand the covenants that we enter into in the endowment ordinance. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles said, The temple account, for reasons that are apparent to those familiar with its teachings, has a different division of events. It seems clear that the six days are one continuing period, and that there is no one place where the dividing lines between the successive events must of necessity be placed. Let me paraphrase that. If you listen closely to the language in the temple account, you'll notice that it seems as though there's no dividing line between the periods of time, but that it's one continuing period. 
And as with all scripture, there are multiple possible meanings to each verse. So as we study with the companionship of the Holy Ghost, the Lord can reveal to us other lessons that can be learned through any verse of scripture. So though our discussion will focus on specific lessons and specific interpretations and meanings, there might be others out there that the Lord is willing to reveal to us as we study with the Spirit. So back to the focus of our discussion today. Why was the earth created? Why did God do all that he did to bring about this earth, the plant life? Life, the animal life, and everything around this earth. To help us with that answer, let's look at the six creative periods. The first phrase in Genesis, in the beginning, comes from a Hebrew word that Joseph Smith taught would be more appropriately translated, the head of the gods called the gods together, and they organized and formed the heavens and the earth. In the book of Abraham, we also read that the gods formed the earth. This gives the idea that there's more than one person involved in the creation. It's not just God, but it's actually Jesus Christ. He said that he created these by his only begotten. And so Jesus Christ is there, and we know he was there with others. Michael, who became Adam, and others from that group of noble and great spirits that were with Jehovah, or with Jesus Christ, in the premortal world. They were all taking part in some way in the creation of the earth. Throughout Moses chapter 1 and now into chapter 2, Jehovah, or Jesus Christ, is speaking. But he's speaking as if he were the Father. And that's because he's been given authority from the Father to speak as if he were the Father. This is what we call divine investiture of authority. And he speaks and tells Moses that in the beginning, he created the heaven and the earth, and that the earth was empty and desolate at first. And now we know that there seems to have been water on the earth, and that the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the waters. And he said, let there be light, and there was light. We know that this is not the sun, because the sun was brought into creation in a later period. And some would argue that this is the Big Bang that some scientists believe may have happened. A burst of pure energy at the command of God, by the way, that put into movement the elements that would be formed into galaxies, stars, and planets. But I like to think of this as the light of Christ. Remember in the Doctrine and Covenants, we learn that the light of Christ is before all things. It proceeds forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space, allowing the sun to be in all and through all things. The light of truth, illuminating the sun, the moon, the stars, and every living thing, even us. His is the light, which is in all things, which gives life to all things. And his light is even the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God. So the light of Christ, not discernible by our natural eyes, is something that the Holy Ghost seems to use in order to do his work. This quote might shed a little bit of light on this topic. Elder James E. Talmadge, a scientist himself, said, Through the power of the Spirit, the Father and the Son operate in their creative acts and in their general dealings with the human family. The Holy Ghost may be regarded as the minister of the Godhead, carrying into effect the decision of the Supreme Council. There's that reference to the Council of Gods in the premortal life. In the execution of these great purposes, the Holy Ghost directs and controls the varied forces of nature. Gravitation, sound, heat, light, and the still more mysterious and seemingly supernatural power of electricity are but the common servants of the Holy Ghost in his operations. So the light of Christ that fills the immensity of space seems to provide a means for all of these laws of gravity and electricity and wireless technology, I would add, and anything else that takes place, it actually uses the light of Christ. The light of Christ gives life and energy to all things, including us. And it seems to me that if something were to take place at the beginning of the creation, there would have to be that light, that light of Christ that would fill the immensity of space and allow for life and all of the other laws that the Holy Ghost would use in carrying out the creative commands of God in this creation. So after he says, let there be light, and there was light, he divides the light from the darkness. And there's a lot of things we could learn from that. Ponder that truth for a second. When does God divide light from darkness in our life now? Perhaps in the premortal life, interesting things we can learn from that verse. On what God calls the second day, he creates a firmament, or in the book of Abraham, the word used is expanse, which is probably a better translation, because a firmament 
came from an ancient idea that the heavens were a solid dome over the earth, and so a, a firm or solid sphere. And thus you get the idea of the windows of heaven opening so that the rain could come during the flood. But what's interesting here is that God divides the waters. And it might help to note that anciently, the water was a symbol of chaotic matter. It was constantly moving. It didn't have any form. And so it was a symbol of chaos. And this whole creation story, in fact, all of the gospel, is a story of God taking unorganized matter and chaos or turmoil and trial and making out of it something that's eternal and beautiful and organized. We even know that this earth was created from existing matter. In fact, the prophet Joseph Smith said, This earth was organized or formed out of other planets which were broke up and remodeled and made into the one in which we live. So anciently, water was seen as a symbol of chaotic matter because it's constantly moving, it's uncontrollable, it's unknown, it's formless, yet made out of matter. And God divides this chaos from this chaos and he creates an expanse a place of order in between the chaos or the waters. And God is always doing this with us as well. In fact, you'll notice in the Old Testament several times, and even in the Book of Mormon, God leads his people through the waters. The Red Sea is parted as the Israelites go toward the Promised Land. They cross through the Jordan River, which is parted, and they go enter into the Promised Land. Of course, the Nephites travel across the waters. The Jaredites travel across the waters. We even travel through the waters of baptism. We are all in the midst of our own chaotic waters, being carried by the Lord to our own promised land. And the scriptures are filled with these object lessons. And this expanse between the earth and the clouds in the sky would allow for rain and weather, which would then allow for life on this planet. So in creating this expanse or firmament, he divides the chaos. Remember waters being a symbol of chaos. The waters on the earth from the waters in the heavens, he divides the two. And he does this throughout the Bible and throughout our lives, where he seems to part the darkness and show us a single path that can lead us directly home to him. And then on day three, you have the creation of the land and the vision between land and oceans. So this wrinkling of the earth's crust causing land to rise up out of the waters. Now, it's apparent in the text that it was all one giant landmass at the time, which is a symbol of unity, how when God creates it, it's united, it's not divided. And we know that eventually that continent would be divided, but we also know that in the end, all continents will come back together again and form one united landmass with one united people and even one united language. And on what God called the third day, he also said, let the earth bring forth grass. And in that, he's establishing a biological principle that is set forth even in the creation that all things would yield seed to propagate their own kind or their own species. One interesting note for you in your study is in the book of Abraham in chapters four and five, if you go through that creation account and highlight all of the action words and note who or what is acting in each instance, you learn some really interesting truths about how God works, particularly through the creative periods. You'll notice, for example, in Abraham that it says, the gods said, let us prepare the earth to bring forth grass. And then it says that the gods organized the earth to bring forth grass. And then later it says that the gods saw that they were obeyed. Interesting to note that process. This is a very deliberate creation. This is not just something that has happened by chance. God is very involved in this creation process. But when it comes to organizing the earth itself and the elements of the earth, the plants and animal life, they command the elements and prepare the earth. They organize the earth and then they watch that the elements obey their command. Then on day four, God creates the lights in the expanse. So you have the sun, the moon, the stars. President Russell M. Nelson explained, lights in the expanse of heaven were organized so there could be seasons and other means of measuring time. During this period, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the earth were placed in proper relationship to one another. The sun, with its vast stores of hydrogen, was to serve as a giant furnace to provide light and heat for the earth and life upon it. So the sun, moon, and stars are significant. They determine our measurement of time, our seasons, and they play a role in our biological rhythms and the reproductive schedules and lifetimes of many different forms of life on the earth. 
And then, of course, on day five, you have the creation of all of the animal life on the earth, the creeping things and creatures and beasts of the field. And after each creative period, God looked at his creations and said that they were good. Now, remember, we're looking throughout our study today for the reason why. Why was all of this created? Now we come to the creation of man. God said that he would create man in his own image and likeness. And the Hebrew word for likeness is a word that also means to look like or be like. So man is created to be and look like God. We're not just mere creations of God, but we are his offspring. Notice the differences when God is creating elements of the earth versus when he's creating man. He said, let the earth bring forth grass, let the earth bring forth life in the waters, let the earth bring forth the beasts of the field. But when it comes to the creation of man, he said, let us create man after our image and likeness. So it's obvious here that there's more than one God taking part in this creation of man. Let us make man in our image, male and female. President Joseph F. Smith said, There's a change in creators here, and the Father himself became personally involved. The man Adam was born of woman into this world the same as Jesus and you and I. President Brigham Young has added to this conversation, God said he created man as we create our children. For there is no other process of creation in heaven, on earth, in the earth, under the earth, or in all the eternities that is, that were, or ever that will be. There exist fixed laws and regulations by which the elements are fashioned, and this process of creation is from everlasting to everlasting. We also will get into this in an episode in a couple weeks, but in Moses 6, the Lord instructs them that as they were born by water, blood, and spirit, so they need to be reborn by water, blood, and spirit. And we'll get into that, like I said, in a couple of weeks, but it's symbolic. The birth process through water, blood, and spirit is very symbolic and may even be likened to an ordinance in ways. We are offspring of divine heavenly beings. Imagine how your life would be different today and what choices you might make or no longer make if you did not know that you were a child of God. As we're out and about in the world around us, how would the world we live in be different if every single person on this earth understood in a very personal way that they are a child of God. For people on the earth who do know this, it can make all the difference in the choices they make and their capacity to experience true joy. So now with the creation of male and female, have we found the reason why the earth was created? The answer is we're not quite there yet, but we're close. In order to understand the full purpose of the earth's creation, we have to go to modern revelation. To say that the creation of a man or a woman is the whole purpose of the creation of the earth is incomplete. In the Doctrine and Covenants, section 49, verse number 15, it says, Verily I say unto you that whoso forbiddeth to marry is not ordained of God, for marriage is ordained of God unto man. And this is the kicker. Wherefore, it is lawful that he should have one wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, and all this, that the earth might answer the end of its creation. So what is God's reason? Why he created the earth and everything on it? And for that matter, why he even created man and woman? The reason is marriage. Remember the family, a proclamation to the world, states that marriage between a man and a woman is central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of His children. It's central. It's the entire purpose for the plan. You and I are even created for the purpose to be married one day, to perpetuate the eternal family, and to become capable of receiving all that God has, including eternal joy. It's interesting to note that here in the beginning of the Bible, God tells us from the very start that the entire purpose of the earth and its creation is for man and wife to be united and become one flesh. And then in the last book of the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi prophesies that if the fathers and the children aren't sealed to each other, the whole earth will be utterly wasted. And that scripture, by the way, is repeated again in the Book of Mormon, in the Doctrine and Covenants, and in the Pearl of Great Price. 
We know from modern revelation that when Adam and Eve were placed in the garden and they were created, they were married. They were sealed together. So man wasn't created just to be here. Man was created and woman was created to be together. The whole purpose of creation was to establish a family, to perpetuate an eternal family, and to establish a family that could also bring the rest of God's spirit children here to earth. Considering the fact that the family is the central purpose of God's plan. It's no wonder that the prophets of our day have warned that the disintegration of the family will bring upon all of us the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets. Elder D. Todd Christofferson said in his talk called Why Marriage, Why Family, our claims for the role of marriage and family rest not on social science, but on the truth that they're God's creation. It is he who in the beginning created Adam and Eve in his image, male and female, and joined them as husband and wife to become one flesh and to multiply and replenish the earth. Each individual carries the divine image, but it is in the matrimonial union of male and female as one that we attain perhaps the most complete meaning of our having been made in the image of God, male and female. Neither we nor any other mortal can alter this divine order of matrimony. It's not a human invention. Such marriage is indeed from above, from God, and is as much a part of the plan of happiness as the fall and the Savior's atonement. What a powerful statement that is. Marriage between a man and a woman is the purpose of creation. Everything that God did during the creation and everything he does now is to help perpetuate that eternal family which will in turn provide us the greatest amount of joy that's available in all eternity. Now, we know that today we are married as man and wife in God's holy temple. How fitting that in the place where we culminate the very purpose of the earth's creation, we also learn of its creation. That creation finds exalting and eternal purpose in the ordinances of the temple, particularly in the holy order of matrimony after the new and everlasting covenant. Let's talk for just a moment about the word covenant. The word testament is the same as the word covenant. They mean the same thing. And so the Old Testament is about this old covenant, which is the same covenant that God made with his children in the premortal life. Those who were faithful, exceedingly faithful, were given a promise to one day inherit all that he had. Remember, a glory added upon their heads forever and ever. And they come to earth, and that covenant is renewed through Abraham and his fathers and his posterity, renewed to that house of Israel. And this is found in the Old Testament. Well, in the New Testament, you have the story of the Savior teaching about that same covenant and promising access to that same covenant. And now in our day, in our dispensation, the last dispensation, we refer to it as the new and everlasting covenant, or a restored covenant that is now accessible through all the ordinances of the priesthood stood in our day. And that covenant has everything to do with the temple. That covenant promises every one of God's children that through faith on the name of Jesus Christ and by repentance and obedience to the ordinances of his gospel, through the Savior Jesus Christ, we can all receive all that he has. And that covenant can only be fulfilled to a man and a woman who have become one together. And so we work to live as faithful as we can. And if marriage doesn't happen for us in this life, we're promised that it will in the next. And it is after men and women are brought together and commanded to multiply and fill the earth that they are then given dominion over all the creations that God has placed on the earth, including the earth itself. So the whole purpose of the creation of all of these things is to put them under the responsibility of mankind. They're to help mankind in this process of being tested and tried to see whether they will do all things the Lord their God should command them. Remember, that's from Abraham chapter 3 from our last episode. So everything God gives to us is to help us become like him. We're given stewardship over the earth, to take good care of the earth, to till it, and to cultivate it. We're given charge over the animals and the plant life on the earth. They're to help us. They're for meat for us. And they're to allow us opportunities to become like our Heavenly Father. And now that man, woman, and eternal marriage have now been put on the earth, which is the whole purpose of this creation, he then looks over all of his works 
and notes that now all these things are very good. He rested from his work and he blessed and sanctified the seventh day. Here's a new way to look at the Sabbath day. Remember, speaking of Moses and the Israelites in Doctrine and Covenants 84, verse 24 says that the Israelites hardened their hearts and could not endure God's presence. Therefore, the Lord in his wrath swore that they should not enter into his rest while in the wilderness which rest is the fullness of his glory. This is a great insight into how we can start viewing the Sabbath day. The Sabbath can be seen as a day of rest or as a symbol of God's glory. When you think of it that way, it definitely ought to change how we think about what we do during that day. If we're entering into his holy time, and we'll talk about that more as we get into the Ten Commandments and even into the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness. But uh, the Sabbath day, something to ponder about. And now in Moses chapter 3, or Genesis chapter 2, God tells us some things about the creation. They're not in chronological order, but in verse 5, he says that all things were created spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth. Now, there's two ways to look at this. One meaning is that they were created in the spirit before they were created with a physical body. Another way to look at this verse is that before the natural man existed, before the fallen man, before the fall of the earth, When the earth was created, it was created in a spiritual state or in a paradisiacal state. And the earth itself is a symbol of you and I. God created man in this spiritual form that uh, could not die. And then eventually man experiences a fall. And the earth does as well, where thorns and thistles and briars and noxious weeds will grow. And of course, they'll torment and afflict all of us throughout our life. And that fall also brings about disease and sickness and death and lots of imperfection. And then the earth will be cleansed. Of course, it was bathed in water at the flood. It will be bathed in the baptism of fire at the second coming and eventually go back to a millennial or paradisical state during the millennium. And after that, it will be sanctified and become the celestial kingdom. And we go through that same process. We, through a second birth or through baptism and receiving the Holy Ghost, are washed clean. And then all of the sin and dross is burned from our souls as we receive the Holy Ghost and eventually become sanctified. So we move from this celestial to a terrestrial state and then eventually to a celestial and glorified state. Remember once again, all that God teaches us is really one big object lesson about his work and glory, which is to bring us home transformed like him. Now, much of the rest of Moses chapter 3 is where the Lord gives us more detail about the creation of mankind and also the Garden of Eden where he places man and woman. So first in verse 7, he says that he breathes into the nostrils of man the breath of life and man became a living soul. In Abraham, it notes that the gods took man's spirit and put it into him. So the physical body and the spirit now making a living soul. Joseph Smith said that of the Hebrew word that is translated breath of life, when it's applied to Eve, it should be translated as the breath of lives. In conjunction with that comment, it's interesting to note the meaning of Eve's name. The name Eve could be translated to mean life giver. And so you have Adam's name, which is coming from the same root as the word ground. So the words Adam or man and ground have a very common root and then Eve as the life giver. Now, skipping down to verse 18, when God created man, he said that it was not good for man to be alone, so he would make a help meet for Adam. Now, in today's language, a help meet can sound degrading to some people. It sounds more like an assistant, but really, in the original Hebrew, the words help meet would be someone who is suitable or complementary to Adam. So this is someone who really completes Adam. It's his other half. In fact, it's interesting to note that in the modern Hebrew, the word for bachelor is a word that also means empty or incomplete. And so Eve, as the life giver, was meant to complete Adam. They're, they're actually joined together as one great whole. And the Lord emphasizes that point a few times later in this chapter. In verse 21, the prophets today have said that this is very symbolic and not literal, but God said that he took one of Adam's ribs from his side 
and created woman. And this is symbolic because the woman is not from the head or the neck or the feet of Adam, but from his side, symbolizing their equality. Men and women are different. They're not the same, but they're equal, and they're to work as equal partners. In fact, later on in verse 24, he says, Man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. I love this idea. It just feels so good to me to picture a father and a mother or a husband and a wife who cleave to each other. That means that they're really inseparable. They're just so connected. They become one flesh. They become one in every way. One of my favorite quotes from a church leader on this is from Elder David A. Bednar. He said, Two compelling doctrinal reasons help us to understand why eternal marriage is essential to the Father's plan. Reason number one is that the natures of male and female spirits complete and perfect each other, and therefore men and women are intended to progress together toward exaltation. Now, I'm going to take a break from his quote for a second and add that despite how we feel in this life, and though some might be confused at their gender and feel that they're a different gender, gender is eternal. It's essential, and we have divine characteristics in our spirit that are distinct because of our gender. Even though the experiences of this life might make us think otherwise, that is an absolute and eternal truth. Now, going back to Elder Bednar's quote, he said, By divine design, men and women are intended to progress together toward perfection and a fullness of glory. Because of their distinctive temperaments and capacities, males and females each bring to a marriage relationship unique perspectives and experiences. The man and the woman contribute differently but equally to a oneness and a unity that can be achieved in no other way. The man completes and perfects the woman, and the woman completes and perfects the man as they learn from and mutually strengthen and bless each other. Neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Then he gives reason number two. By divine design, both a man and a woman are needed to bring children into mortality and to provide the best setting for the rearing and nurturing of children. As Elder Christofferson has taught so well, marriage is about a lot more than just the love of two adults. Marriage is about perpetuating a family unit, and that can only be done eternally And even physically on this earth, you can only bring children into the world by uh, joining a man and a woman together. A home, this is Elder Bednar again, a home with a loving and loyal husband and wife is the supreme setting in which children can be reared in love and righteousness and in which the spiritual and physical needs of children can be met. Remember, when we raise our children, we're not only to protect them physically, but we're to protect them spiritually and to help teach them why they're here on earth and where they're going hereafter. Elder Bednar continues, Just as the unique characteristics of both males and females contribute to the completeness of a marriage relationship, so those same characteristics are vital to the rearing, nurturing, and teaching of children. I think about my own marriage and how many times I am just absolutely imperfect at being a dad or at being a husband. But I watch my wife with our kids, I realize she has gifts and talents that I don't possess and I'm trying to learn from her. And at other times, in moments where I'm less patient, she seems to always be more patient. And when I've become a little bit more frustrated, she's still so calm. And we do that for each other. Other times where she's more frustrated, I can be the calm one. And so we really do complement each other as husband and wife, and we learn to work together. That's not something that just comes naturally every day, but it's something that you work at. It's something that you try to do. You try to balance each other out and to be the one that can calm the other one down or comfort the other one when they need to be comforted or when they need to be uh, told that they're doing a good job, you can be the one to tell them that. And so many family relationships don't have that great blessing of having both a mother and a father in the home. And my heart goes out to single parents. Um, I watched my mother raise uh, my teenage brother and sister alone, and it is very hard. I really, as a parent today, I do not understand how single parents do what they do. 
So if you are a single parent, just know that you amaze me at what you're able to accomplish. And I know that you do it uh, the same way I do it, just relying on our Heavenly Father and His help. But the fact that you are able to do what you do alone is astounding. And so just know that you are doing a good job. And for my single friends out there who might be listening to this podcast, what possibly can you do uh, when you don't have that opportunity in your life right now to cleave unto a husband or a wife and become one flesh? Well, just defend marriage between a man and a woman. And that doesn't mean to be contentious with people who disagree with us. You can still love someone and disagree with them. But respectfully and lovingly defend God's plan. Defend the whole reason why we came to this earth and help be an advocate and a messenger for the Lord. And as you are doing now, of course, prepare yourself to be that one who will cleave unto their spouse and be fiercely and completely loyal. Though marriage is the culmination of God's plan, it's not the only reason that we're here. We're here to do a lot of other things as well, including gathering Israel, helping share the gospel, becoming changed, allowing the Holy Ghost to totally transform us and apply the atoning blood of Christ to our life so we can become like him. So even as a single person, there's so much we can do to accomplish God's will and to bring about his plan in our life as we prepare for the day when marriage does happen or when children are a possibility for us. Now let's focus on the Garden of Eden. I don't know all of the reasons why the Lord talks about the rivers and the gold and the lands around the Garden of Eden, but I do want to make just a couple of points here. First of all, these names of these rivers are rivers that currently exist in the Middle East. But that is not where the Garden of Eden was. We know the Garden of Eden was in Jackson County, Missouri, or at least where Jackson County, Missouri is currently located. And that Adam and Eve, after being removed from the Garden of Eden, were eventually in a place what we call Adam on Amen, which is not far from Jackson County, Missouri, where Adam blessed his posterity before he died. So why do we have these rivers here outside of Eden that currently exist in the Middle East? Well, after the flood and many, many other cataclysmic events since Adam and Eve, the rivers spoken of here likely don't even exist anymore around where Eden was. But Adam's posterity, having lived and known some of that region where these rivers did exist outside of Eden, likely used those same names to name rivers in the Old Testament times after the flood, after Noah's family had um, come off of the ark and had started to establish the nations in the other side of the world. So that's probably one of the reasons why we see some of those similar names for those rivers. Another interesting note is that this river was one in the garden, and then it parted and became four rivers outside of the garden. And so it's divided, which I think is a great symbol of how there's unity in the presence of God, and that this idea of going out into the world is going out into a place that is divided, and it's not fair, it's not equal. Um, you have in verse 12 that one of the lands was uh, filled with gold, which means that there was another that may not have had much gold. So that contributes to this idea and reality that one once they left the garden, they're going to enter a world that is difficult, where life is not fair, and that you can try and seek as close as you can fairness for all, but there are going to be differences, and there's going to be division, and you're going to have to try to figure out how to create unity, or be like the Lord and create unity and order out of chaos and division. And that is something we struggle even today in doing. But the Lord's covenants, in fact, even the covenant of consecration that we enter into in the temple, helps us prepare ourselves to create order out of chaos, to bring unity out of division, and to bring oneness despite our differences. Now, before we wrap up this episode, we have to have a conversation about the trees in the garden. Of course, we know there was a tree of life, and there was in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Some of the most common questions that I've heard when it comes to this part of the Bible story are things like, why would God give conflicting commandments to multiply and replenish the earth, and then also to not partake of the fruit? Another question I've heard is, why would God 
uh, tell them not to fall if they're supposed to fall? These are really good questions, and I hope that our conversation now will give some insight to these and help you understand some of those answers and even give you some other things to look for, particularly as you worship in the temples of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, where we are given the most detailed and insightful account of what took place in the Garden of Eden. Another hope I have for this conversation is to set us up really, really effectively for our conversation next week, where we talk about the fall and partaking of the forbidden fruit. The Garden of Eden was the first temple on the earth, and even the arrangement of the trees in the garden are symbolic of the temple that the Israelites used, the tabernacle in the wilderness, and they're also symbolic even of our temple today. I'm not going to go into more details on that, but uh, just ponder that sometime and, and really take note of that. Next time you go to the temple, think about the setup of the garden, think about the directions, the positions of those things, and what the symbols of those trees represent in our life today and in the temple. One of the most important and actually a key element of God's plan is agency. Remember, we had to choose whether or not we wanted to exercise exceedingly great faith in the pre-mortal life. And God told us that we will try them to see if they will choose to do all that the Lord their God will command them on this earth. So choice is everything. Our choices every day, small or great, add up and will ultimately determine whether or not we receive into ourselves the Holy Ghost and become changed. So choice is everything. And God pl- plants in the Garden of Eden these two trees, a tree of life and a tree of knowledge of good and evil, preserving agency by giving them a choice. In order to have choice, there has to be opposition. If there's only one choice, then there's really no choice. If you have two opposing things, now you have a choice to make. It's important here to remember the first commandment given to Adam and Eve was to multiply and replenish the earth. That's something that must be on their mind to some degree at this point, though we don't know what they knew about multiplying. We don't know if they had knowledge yet of how to multiply and replenish the earth. But we do know that in their spiritual state or this paradisiacal state, they didn't have the ability to procreate yet. The tree of life in the garden was Adam and Eve's ticket to immortality. As long as they had access to that tree, they would never die. And aside from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, they had no opposition in their life. They didn't know good from evil. They didn't know hot from cold. They're in what I like to call a state of is. They simply existed. They weren't necessarily happy because they didn't know what sadness was. And so in this state... They had free access to the tree of life, which would allow them to continue to live forever. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, on the other hand, would grant to them opposition in all things. The knowledge granted by the fruit of that tree would allow them all the chances they would need in order to progress and learn from their own experience. And giving them access to that tree wasn't only important because it gave them a choice, but being a perfect God, God created them in a perfect state and allowed them to choose whether or not they would enter into a mortal fallen state where they would have to experience a lot of trials and adversity in their lives. But he also gave them this tree, allowing them the opportunity to fall. So he created them in a state that was able to fall. This is all important because the fall would not be a plan B. It wasn't an accident. It was actually part of the very plan that God had designed. They needed to be created in this paradisiacal state. They needed to fall but they had to choose to do it for themselves, and then they would be able to be redeemed again through a redeemer or a savior that would bring them back into the presence of God after having had a chance to prove themselves, to learn from their own experience. As God presents these trees to Adam and Eve, he gives them a, a commandment in verse 16. I, the Lord God, commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Remember the word freely. That's important here. There are no trying consequences from partaking of any of the trees in the garden. And then you notice a comma at the end of that verse. Verse 17 is a continuation. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Nevertheless, thou mayest choose for thyself, for it is given unto thee. But remember that I forbid it. 
for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, the word it, I forbid it, you can look at that word in a couple of ways. The antecedent to it, what is it? I forbid what? Well, you could look at that and say, he forbids eating of it, or you could look back at the beginning of the sentence in verse 16 and say that he forbids eating of it freely, like they could of every other tree in the garden. In other words, there is a trying consequence for eating of that fruit. President Joseph Fielding Smith said this, Just why the Lord would say to Adam that he forbade him to partake of the fruit of that tree is not made clear in the Bible account. But in the original, as it comes to us in the book of Moses, it is made definitely clear. It is that the Lord said to Adam that if he wished to remain as he was in the garden, remember that's immortal, in a state of of being that has no sorrow and no happiness, then he was not to eat of the fruit. But if he desired to eat it and partake of death, he was at liberty to do so. It's given unto thee, remember. It's clear that the account of these events that is taught in the temple is by far the most detailed and most insightful. And if you listen carefully in the endowment session, you'll notice that it's possible that God was telling them that he forbid that they eat of this fruit at that time. Uh, that there might be another time that it wasn't forbidden, but at least for that time it was forbidden. And remember, he's allowing Satan or Lucifer to come and to tempt them. And if they succumb to that temptation, the plan is to provide a savior for them. Some people have asked the question, well, why would God give them these two commandments that seem to conflict? You've got to multiply and replenish the earth, but in order to do so, you'd have to fall, but yet you're also not supposed to eat of that fruit and fall. Well, it's not necessarily true that he gave them conflicting commandments. Remember, we don't know what Adam and Eve knew about how to multiply and replenish the earth when they were in the garden. It's possible that they didn't know about that until they fell. And so having the commandment to multiply and replenish the earth may not have meant to them at that time that they needed to fall. Perhaps they would learn at a later time with further instructions that a fall would be necessary in order to procreate. Another question I have often heard is, why would God give them a commandment that they're supposed to break? They're supposed to fall, but yet he told them not to partake of that fruit. Well, going back, perhaps it just wasn't the right time. Perhaps he was allowing them to be tempted at this time to see what they would do, but perhaps later on he would give them instructions. I don't know. But President Dallin H. Oaks said this, When Adam and Eve received the first commandment, they were in a transitional state, no longer in the spirit world, but with physical bodies not yet subject to death and not yet capable of procreation. They could not fulfill the Father's first commandment without transgressing the barrier between the bliss of the Garden of Eden and the terrible trials and wonderful opportunities of mortal life. For reasons that have not been revealed, this transition or fall could not happen without a transgression, an exercise of moral agency amounting to a willful breaking of a law. This would be a planned offense, a formality to serve an eternal purpose. The prophet Lehi explained that if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but would have remained in the same state in which he was created. Another important point to make here is the essential need for agency. In 2 Nephi chapter 2, verse 15, it says, To bring about his eternal purposes in the end of man, after he had created our first parents, and the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air, and all things which are created, it must needs be that there was an opposition, even the forbidden fruit in opposition to the tree of life, the one being sweet and the other bitter. So was God actually hoping that Adam would sin and partake of this fruit, knowing the fall needed to occur? Was it a sin for Adam to partake? We'll address that question and a lot more about the fall in our next episode next week. So to wrap up, here is our teaching tip for the day. The most effective teachers don't know the answers to every question. The most effective teachers are teaching because they're motivated by an internal love 
for the people they're teaching, whether that's your children or students or people in your ward or Sunday school classes. Love those you teach. Pray for them by name. Know them by name. Know their needs and love them. You've heard the adage that no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Well, it's true. And find ways to help them see and feel that love. You might even consider just sincerely telling them, I love you. If the people you teach can feel the love you have for them, they will be so much more receptive to the messages that you have to share. And it will invite the Holy Ghost to be present. And let's be honest, the Holy Ghost will be able to teach them far more than you and I would ever be able to teach them. And it's true, not everyone can be easy to love. But as a seminary teacher, some of the most beautiful experiences I had was learning to love those who were hardest to love. I remember taking weeks praying by name for my students and trying so hard to love the ones that were so disrespectful or so unengaged and seemed to care nothing about the gospel. I don't know how to describe it, but as I prayed for them by name every day, and as I tried so hard to prepare my lessons specifically with them in mind, over time, in many of those instances, I saw a change happen in that individual. In fact, some of those students that I had, I still keep in touch with today and actually have some really strong connections and relationships with them even today. God is good. So our teaching tip for today is to pray and learn to cultivate Christ-like love for those you teach. Well, that wraps it up. I love all of you. I'm so thankful to have you as a listener to this podcast. And thank you to all of you who are helping make this podcast more accessible by sharing it or by leaving a review or rating this podcast in your podcast app. I really hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Thanks for listening in and for taking the time to subscribe and send this episode to people you love. If you can, don't forget to rate this podcast and take a few seconds to leave a review for other listeners. If you'd like, you can connect with me on Instagram at Peterson. Until our next episode, remember there is always hope in Christ.